you know, if you land at the Columbia Airport, there's a big sign there. It's there, you know, America's uh, most friendly, uh, you know, or most military friendly community. Uh, it's the truth. Uh, it absolutely is. Uh, I remember the first weekend I was here with my family driving through the downtown area and there were banners uh, that were highlighting the uh, sort of the initiation of the centennial year. Uh, and it said, Our Fort Jackson. Uh, to me, as, as a new leader uh, coming to this mission, it meant a lot. Uh, it meant that they have ownership. Uh, they feel a partnership uh, with what the United States Army uh, has accomplished here throughout these many, many years. You know, as we take a look at the missions here at Fort Jackson, uh, we certainly uh, support our United States Army, and we've got a, a, a range of missions uh, from basic training uh, to training our Adjutant General Corps, our financial uh, management experts. Uh, we, we train our chaplains here. Uh, we also uh, train our drill sergeants. Uh, that not only serve here at Fort Jackson, but serve at the other uh, basic, basic training locations of Fort Leonard Wood, Fort Sill, and Fort Benning. Uh, but we also uh, support our National Guard and our Reserve Forces. Uh, so a part of Fort Jackson is this jewel we call Camp McCready, and the South Carolina National Guard has leveraged that training platform for many, many years as they support uh, our great army uh, in this nation, uh, and even today, uh, they are currently deployed all over uh, the globe making a difference. Uh, the United States Army Reserve has several reserve centers here. Uh, certainly captured kind of foremost with the 81st Regional Support Command, which has its lineage in the very first division that we trained here in 1917, the Wildcat Division. Uh, so we are a total Army effort here uh, supporting the regular Army, uh, the U.S. Army Reserve, and the National Guard, most proudly uh, the South Carolina uh, National Guard. When we take a look at Hilton Field, our, our field, that sacred field that we graduate our soldiers on, well, Sergeant Hilton, Medal of Honor winner, uh, you know, served in the South Carolina National Guard, was a part of the old Hickory Division, the 30th Division, uh, and they fought forward. Ultimately, the 30th Division was reactivated right here at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. So we have a great history uh, tied to the South Carolina National Guard that we're very, very proud of. Uh, and in crisis, both while we're deployed, our soldiers that graduate from here ultimately serve alongside South Carolina National Guardsmen, but also in crisis here. Uh, if we have hurricanes or disasters here, we're always ready. Uh, to team up with their leadership uh, for what they do for the great citizens uh, here in the state of South Carolina. And so we're very, very uh, proud of that. It certainly has played, uh, Fort Jackson has certainly played its part in the previous wars that America has had. Uh, World War I, of course, and uh, you, know, you think about the, uh, you know, all the divisions that came through during World War II. Have, have you talked with anybody about the World War II? experiences there not just kind of a quick uh, overview so yeah tell okay because they you know they trained <clears throat> um they they trained entire divisions the, the, the training method was different during world war ii uh, just like world war one instead of doing individuals they they brought in entire um or they, they brought in trainees and they created an entire division where n none had existed before so they started off with basic they started off with basic training of, at the individual level, and then they worked up to squad, platoon, company, and they did division-level maneuvers. Uh, they did not do them on post. Uh, they, uh, they leased uh, farmland out in the countryside between Fort Jackson and Fort Bragg, and they would do maneuvers in the countryside where they practiced uh, doing large-scale uh, unit operations. Uh, on the far, far side of Fort Jackson is, is Camp McCready, which is a, is a national, it's, now it is a National Guard installation. Uh, it originally was the place where they did rifle training during World War, uh, World War II. And the trainees would, would march from the cantonment area out, is it Leesburg Road, I believe? And they, they would march all the way out there and do their, do their rifle training. They would camp out there for 
a week or so, and they, um, if you go out there, there's, there's, some, in, there's some interesting graffiti on the, because uh, back in those days when they did, they did training, they actually had live people moving the targets up and down, and they were behind these concrete barriers so they wouldn't get shot. And they would run the targets up, and people would shoot, and they would run the targets down, and they would mark uh, where they hit in the black, they would mark with a white square, and uh, where they hit in the white with a black square, and if they missed it completely, they would run up what was called Maggie's drawers. Uh, and, uh, and of course, to keep them safe, they had, they, they, when, when the firing started, they would hunker down behind the concrete. And this was the way they did training all the way up until the 1950s. You really have to talk with the people because there's, there's what the, the history books say, uh, mine included, and then there's what really happened. And uh, you, 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 there's this idea that the Army is this rigid institution and someone gives an order and it goes straight down the chain of command and that's the way it is. And it just, it just, doesn't, it just doesn't happen that way, <laughs> either in garrison or in combat. And, uh, uh, and, and certainly these social changes with racial integration and with, uh, with gender integration, you know, it, 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 you said it didn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, even, even going back to my answer to the earlier question, it, it, uh, you know, I'm sure there were bumps there. And in fact, I've, there, there, were some, there, were some, there were some bumps, but they, they worked through them just like any other situation. They did have a training area for Vietnam on post, uh, I think they called it Bal Bang, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, where they uh, uh, they would they would simulate the experience of going through a village in Vietnam, and during the 60s they they used that to prepare young men for for going to Southeast Asia. It's it's in some ways the, the transportation networks have have brought it closer to Colombia than it was. Uh, it used to be a lot more isolated. Uh, in fact, I'm writing a, a chapter for an edited volume about about that. You, know, you said you did a documentary about the flooding of 2015. Um, that Gill Creek watershed was 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 quite a barrier between. It, it was a physical barrier between Columbia and Fort Jackson, and um, and then you know, of course, you got the Forest Lake Country Club and the golf course, and so. Physically, there was a lot more isolation between the two than than there is now. Uh, I, uh, you know, Interstate 77 was not completed through. That was the last part of Interstate 77 to be completed. Uh, I remember the day it opened because before it opened, all the traffic came down Percival Road where I lived, and it was just a steady stream of cars getting off the interstate and going down to uh, uh, I think it was Forest Forest Drive. And, and getting back onto the interstate. And uh, they, they finally, because they had to drain Boyd and Arbor Pond, they had to get the land from the military. I'm sure Fort Jackson had to do some other things to secure that, that boundary. And uh, that didn't open up until like 1995. And, uh, and, it, and it wasn't until that happened that that whole area developing, you know, Walmart and uh, that was, the remains of the Andrew Jackson homes. There, there had been a, a post housing development there. It was, it was off post, but it, I think some of the funding came uh, through the Defense Department or through the federal government, and that was just a big open lot. The, the street, the, the, the curbs were still there from World War II. And uh, after the interstate came through, all that just just exploded. And it, it, in, in that regard, it brought it brought the post more toward Columbia, if, if you know, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, Fort Jackson is important to Columbia just as much as Columbia is to Fort Jackson on many different levels, uh, whether you're talking social, economic, uh, just the community involvement, the outreach between the uh, inhabitants of Fort Jackson as well as the community. And for example, over two thirds of our serving members here at Fort Jackson actually live in the community of Columbia and all of the surrounding counties, Kershaw County, uh, Richland County, Lexington County, uh, any one of these counties, somebody from Fort Jackson actually resides there. 
And what's unique about Fort Jackson and the Columbia area, specifically the Midlands, uh, it's probably the most military friendly community in the country. Uh, so many of our service members, upon completion of their tour of duty, either will reside here or return after they complete their tour of duty somewhere else. Uh, significance of the drill sergeant. Uh, the irony that you asked me that question, uh, I've been tagged with the title of being America's drill sergeant. Uh, having served as a drill sergeant uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia, I trained infantrymen and I served in that capacity for about two years. And then I moved on to teach at the drill sergeant school at Fort Benning for another three years. I was fortunate to be selected to be the commandant of the Army Drill Sergeant School uh, at that time and recognized the opportunity to uh, basically create an instructor who knew how to think as opposed to what to think. Uh, I, I have a very close affinity to that particular job or role, having served in the capacity of a drill sergeant or a leader of drill sergeants uh, throughout multiple assignments in my career. And I would say that the job of a drill sergeant by far was the most challenging and gratifying job that I've ever had. I think that our Army non-commissioned officers who do well in their units uh, where they practice their military occupational specialty and do their daily jobs, when they come and perform a job of a drill sergeant successfully and move back into their career path, they take with them a skill set that the average citizen uh, would, would, would just ask for uh, out of a basic employee. But what I would share is that that skill set of being a master of time management, a master of personnel management, a master of training management uh, is a skill set that, again, I, I think that the average employer would pay a, a great amount of money for uh, to achieve somebody on their team to walk in the door with that skill set. And that's what drill sergeants leave this challenging job over a 24 to 36 month period, uh, what, what they take back with them when they go back out in the force. The 100th uh, centennial uh, for Fort Jackson, in my opinion, is a, is a critical piece within the, our history of the military. It has a, been a training base from the onset, uh, from the beginning of, well, toward World War I, uh, preparing soldiers to go into combat. And it is an integral part of training, uh, and which brings me into the picture as a training specialist for the Drill Sergeant Program is we are responsible for training that soldier. The drill sergeant program didn't start until 1964. Prior to 1964, trainers that, that trained basic trainees uh, were just NCOs that showed up at the training unit and by virtue of being assigned to that unit became the primary trainers. In 1962, Cyrus Vance, who was the secretary at the time, gave a mission to the undersecretary, Stephen Ailes, to conduct a recruit survey. Out of that survey, it took him a whole year and he canvassed all the services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and made numerous visits with his team that he had put together from Human Resources Command, which was at the time the Army was called Continental Army Command. And out of this survey is when he came up with five findings from that survey. He gave his report to Cyrus Vance in the end of 1963. Uh, his report is dated the 26th of December. Cyrus Vance really liked that report and out of those five findings was there was a need to have a qualified educated trainer in the training base. His recommendation to solve that problem was the creation of drill sergeant schools. And so they put together in January of 64 a pilot course which they came here to Fort Jackson. That is why Fort Jackson is considered the birthplace of the drill sergeant. Uh, in they took the brand new NCO Academy at the time, the 3rd United States Army Non-Commissioned Officer, Officer Academy, took their course curriculum and tweaked it slightly and came up with a five-week pilot course. They ran that pilot course after fielding throughout the Army and selecting the best qualified NCOs to bring them in to, to do this training. And that also included the officers as well that was going to be uh, in the training base. They ran that pilot. Once the pilot was conducted here at Fort Jackson, they created the 8th Training Brigade, or battalion, here at Fort Jackson and put 24 of those brand new instructors in there with a brand new eight-week basic training combat uh, program of instruction. They sent 12 of them to 
Fort Gordon, Georgia. And they tested them for two cycles under this new uh, program of instruction for basic combat training using these new drill sergeants and commanders. It was such a success that they formally adopted and established six drill sergeant schools. One being located here at Fort Jackson, one at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, one at Fort Polk, Louisiana, one at Fort Ord, California, and one at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and one at uh, Leonard Wood, Jackson, C, uh, Fort Seal, Oklahoma. Now, during those test cycles, second week into the test cycle, is when the drill sergeant got its famous headgear. Uh, they had went down to Paris Island into a warehouse and retrieved some of the World War I campaign hats, brought them back, and in one of the Army leaders, or in one of the Fort Jackson leaders, you'll see the picture of uh, the drill sergeant receiving these brand new headgear, which became our distinctive headgear, which everybody calls either the brown round or the Smokey the Bear hat. Prior to that, they were wearing the pith helmet, and that's what they wore during the pilot course, and that's what they wore for the first couple weeks of the test cycles. Uh, that formation of drill sergeant schools, you know, uh, the original six, you know, quickly grew. Uh, there was a big need for it. The difference in the training was to bring it down to more of a, a platoon and squad level type interaction between the instructor and the person being trained. Uh, it was to make them more professional uh, in appearance and get rid of the lack of motivation or lack of incentive that they had prior to. And that was the reason for the headgear, that was the reason for incentive pay, that was the reason uh, to make them stand out a little bit more. I believe it's something to be extremely proud of, being the birthplace of the drill sergeant. Um, where the drill sergeant was created, uh, though they were trained in numerous schools throughout the United States, this is something to be extremely proud of because this trainer has become an icon, uh, you know, not throughout just, you know, around Fort Jackson or Army training installations, but it's movies and magazines and books and novels and everything else. Uh, and so, yeah, it's something to be very proud of, uh, you know, for everyone you hear something bad about, there's thousands of them out there doing awesome sacrifices of personal time and family time and away from their kids and their wife, training these new recruits and preparing them to go out to these units to be, you know, efficient soldiers. Well, you know, I had the um, uh, a privilege of giving a speech on the history of Fort Jackson and started out as Camp Jackson. And, you know, it, it has sort of mirrored the um, the progress that uh, our country has made. Uh, uh, when it first started, um, they had uh, all types of infrastructure issues there. Uh, uh, we, it was during a racially segregated period of time in our country and they had to navigate that. And, and today, uh, there's no institution or a part of our American life that better reflects uh, the diversity of our country than uh, the U.S. Army and Fort Jackson certainly part of that. <clears throat> For me, the the greatest milestone uh, though was uh, Friday, uh, uh, May 13, 2005, when the uh, you know, U.S. government announced the BRAC decision. And you know, we didn't know if Fort Jackson would uh, uh, grow or shrink or lose services or gain services, and it turned out to be. Uh, a centennial day um, for uh, Columbia and Fort Jackson in terms of the growth and uh, the uh, uh, missions that were brought to uh, the fort as a result of uh, consolidation of our uh, uh, military post, uh, army post throughout the country. First, uh, I think Columbia and Fort Jackson will always be uh, in a tremendous partnership. Uh, fort Jackson is actually in the city limits of Columbia. Um, so I think, you know, maintaining that uh, partnership, uh, it was the late Ike McLeese who, you know, played such an important role in BRAC in 2005 and making sure that from the business community standpoint, you know, he was both the uh, president of the chamber 
as well as a civilian aide to the, to the Army, Secretary of the Army. And um, I think his legacy, I think, will continue um, to make sure that partnership is maintained and uh, worked uh, very um, uh, hard, and to this day it is. Um, and we'll always, I think, train the uh, soldiers that protect our country. And, um, you know, I think over the years, um, you know, we will always be prepared uh, to defend the country because of the work of Fort Jackson. For the centennial gift from the community to Fort Jackson, we're going to build a centennial park. And this park is going to have two primary purposes. One is going to have a, a practical purpose of meeting some of the needs of the soldiers here at Fort Jackson and some of the th activities that they have. But it's really going to focus on the three to 5,000 people that come here every week for graduation. It's going to give them a place to go and relax and be with a soldier. Uh, the park is going to have a statue, a 20-foot statue of drill sergeants, two drill sergeants, a male and a female drill sergeant. And there'll be an amphitheater, a semicircle amphitheater around it that will seat between 250 and 300 people. So they can go down and take pictures of their soldier uh, at the statue. They can sit in the, the stands. If, if, if uh, the, the unit wanted to have a little quick meeting, they could have a place where they could get everybody together. But the other thing that's going to happen is that we're going to be utilizing the, the area where the post headquarters was up until October. That's been, that post headquarters has been cleared out. There's been uh, some rough grading going. And starting in the 1st of May, we're going to begin to build a Centennial Park. The first part, we're going to do it in phases. The first part is going to focus on the pragmatic side taking care of the visitors and, and, and the soldiers. The next thing we're going to add to it in different uh, in later phases is to add, add an educational component. So as a person is walking through the area, they'll see a, a, an area where we focus on all of the wars that the soldiers from Fort Jackson have participated in, beginning with World War I, and carrying right on through the war on terrorism. And this is going to be something that when somebody goes up to, and they see World War I or any, any of the conflicts, there'll be a monument, a plaque, and then there's going to be some audio visuals attached to it where you can click your, cell, uh, your, uh, your phone to the the to the, the the monument, and it'll tell you a little bit about World War One. It'll tell you about each of the the organ the fights wars, and the thing that we're thinking about is that today only well less than one percent of the of the Americans become uh, soldiers. So many many young children coming through have never heard. They may have heard of World War I and the Korean conflict and the Vietnam conflict, but they don't understand it. So this is to give them an understanding, a better understanding of what it is. And then the, the museum is located right across the street from the, the park. And so hopefully the museum will begin to capture more in detail what happened in World War I and each of the conflicts. Another thing that we're going to have is going to be a pathway of the Patriots where we're going to focus on the Medal of Honor, uh, prisoners of war, people, uh, soldiers that are mission in action, and begin to talk about what it, what, what you, what it means to receive a Medal of Honor. Or if you hear the term POI, what does it mean? And, and again, looking at it from the same concept that we do with the war, the different campaigns, is just to educate and make people aware of, of these things. If you see somebody wearing a Medal of Honor, you're, you're seeing somebody that's put their life really on the line and has done something significant. 
And so all of these things become so important to people who have been in service. What we're trying to do is to open it up to everybody, adults and young people. And from the educational standpoint, what we're going to do is we're going to design this so that you can have the, uh, the presentations here, but yet you can pick up the whole process and move it to the public schools and share the same information in the schools. And I think that kind of educational component is just as important, maybe more important, than it is of taking care of the needs of the soldiers that want to use the park for a retirement ceremony or for promotions or whatever the case may be, or for the visitors that are going to come in here to be with their soldiers. All of that's necessary and something good. But it's that educational component that I think is going to really make this park special.